All right, this is the second hour of Physics 1A for March 22nd. Uh, we're going to use Newton's second law to solve some problems. This is the first one we're looking at. You've got a, uh, a block that's 2 kilograms that's being pushed by a force P. And that force uh, has two different values. In part A, we want to figure out the acceleration of the block if that force is 10 newtons. And in part B, if the force is 30 newtons. Uh, what we know about this is that uh, there's a surface down here. And this is saying that the coefficient of static friction and the coefficient of kinetic friction are equal to each other. Usually in the US is greater, the static friction force, but this is just an example problem. So we're gonna say that they're the same. Now to solve these type of problems, uh, the, first, um, the first thing to do is to draw a diagram of all the forces acting on this object. And the, um, yeah, so what would those forces be? We don't want to draw it on the picture. We want to draw it off to the side. What would those what would those forces be acting on this object? If there's a weight, mass times gravity, it's going to point straight down. What else is there? So P is a force as well, right? So we'll draw a vector for P. So that was the weight. Next, we want to do P. We'll put it down at an angle like this. What else is there? Normal force and friction, Chris. Says. Yep. Okay. We've also got the normal force, which is going to go straight up this way. I will do my best to draw most of these things to scale, although I will probably fail. I think that's probably good. And then finally, there is the friction force, which this goes back this way. The nice thing about problems that involve accelerations are that uh, I don't have to make all the vectors equal to each other. I just need to make some of them equal to each other. OK, so this is going to be our friction force back this way. This is the force P. This is the force uh, M times G. And this is the normal force, which is capital N for that. OK, that's step one. Draw a free body diagram. Just like problems we did at the beginning of the semester, the second step is to draw a xy axis. So what we'll do is we'll just draw a line. Let's make it black. We'll draw a line across here, just like this. And I'm going to say that's my x axis. I'm going to shift it down just a little bit so we can still see some of the vectors. All right, so that's going to be my x axis in this direction. And my y axis will just point perpendicular to that. So it'll go up this way. This is going to be the positive y direction. And that will be the positive x direction. OK, so step one, draw a free body diagram. Step two, draw axes, x, y axes. Um, ideally, you pick those axes such that as many of your forces as possible lie along them. So in this case, f, n, and mg are all lying exactly along one of our axes. Uh, the next step then is to break up any force, such as this p force right here, into components. I'm going to shift this back up a little bit because it looks kind of weird. I put it a little bit too far down. We'll just do that. The P force we need to break up into components. So we'll do that. We'll use two different colors. So we're going to have um, the X component that's going to point kind of like this. Make that one green. And then we're going to have the Y component, which will point perpendicular and down to that, which will go down like this, which will make blue. And then just kind of make sure that this actually goes out to the tip of that. All right. So there we go. We know that this angle here is 37 degrees. Uh, just to make it so that we don't have to write 37 degrees over and over again, I'm going to call that angle theta and label that that's the angle right here. And then say that uh, this little piece on the top right here, the x component, should be p times one of the trig functions. Which function am I going to put in here? Cosine, that's right. And then over here, we're going to have the sine then, because it's opposite theta. So this is going to be p sine theta. And that's it. There's no more forces to break up into components. So the next thing to do then is to use uh, Newton's second law. Now, in this case, we're using Newton's second law, which states that the net force acting on a system or on an object is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration of the object. But this gets broken down into two different equations. We're going to have an x-direction equation and a y-direction equation. So for the x-direction equation, we'll just write it in green and say that that equation is going to say Net force acting in the x direction should be equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration in the x direction. And then in the y direction, we can write the same exact equation, just replace the x's with y's. Net force in the y direction is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration in the y direction. So that equation becomes two equations. 
And then we have to kind of think about um, what the accelerations are. So in our problem, we know that the object is constrained to this surface, which means that it's going to move to the right, which means there's going to be an acceleration that's going to point uh, to the right as well. I'm going to label on my picture right here that the acceleration points this direction. And I'll also say that uh, you don't want to include the acceleration on your free body diagram as a force. So don't attach it to this little point right here but you should probably draw it somewhere on your picture, okay? Another thing I'm gonna say is that this needs to be consistent with the positive direction. So if you make, if you make accelerate, if the accel object is accelerating to the right, then you need to make that direction positive if you wanna make your, your algebra work out properly, okay? All right, so in our problem, this is going to be the acceleration X component. The X component of the acceleration, we're just gonna call A. So for my equation over here, uh, for the X forces, I'm just going to write that the right hand side is going to become mass times just a This is ultimately what we're trying to calculate on the left hand side. I just sum forces So I've got P cosine theta which goes forward Minus the friction force which is pointing backwards and um, I'm, I'm just gonna call this friction so It could be kinetic it could be static we'll talk about that in a second um, in the y direction, I should ask, does anyone have any questions about the x direction? Okay. In the y direction, you can ask the question, what's the acceleration of this object in the y direction? And remember that acceleration means it's zero. Okay, so you guys can all see that. That's good. So ay is equal to zero. It's not gravity. It's just zero. So this whole thing is going to be equal to zero. And then we just have to deal with the left-hand side where we have the normal force, which points up. So we'll have N minus Mg minus P sine theta is equal to zero. Now, once we've gotten to here, we're pretty much done with the physics, but we need to throw in one other equation. The other equation we need to, to add to our system here is going to be the relationship between the friction force and the normal force, which is that the friction force in general should be, yeah, see, so this is where, let's just, let's just say for a second, let's just go ahead and call it kinetic friction and say that the kinetic friction is given by the coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal force. I say kinetic friction because it's sliding, right? It's moving. Okay, y is a y zero. All right, so acceleration, what is acceleration? Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity of an object, right? And velocity is the rate of change of position of an object, right? So in the y direction, if I say that this is my y axis, if vector a was tilted a little bit, a y would not be zero. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Um, in my y direction right here, okay, what is the y coordinate? Like, like if I, if I tell you that this point is the origin, right? What's the Y coordinate of this point right here? If I tell you that this is the origin, this is zero, right? And what's the Y coordinate of this point over here? So what's the Y coordinate of my box as it slides along the surface? It's always zero, right? Yeah. So, so if I wanted to write an equation, Y as a function of time, this would be the equation, right? It's just zero. So what's the y velocity? You take the oh, derivative. Yeah, it's zero. You take the a velocity. Or sorry, you take the derivative. Basically, to get from to get in this direction, right? You just take dy dt to get velocity. You take yeah, it's, it's zero. Right? Yeah, I got. It. I, was, I was just thinking that p is the vector p. Now, that was the angle, so I was just like, oh, maybe it's something. But no, you're right. Yeah, the surface. If if there wasn't a surface here, and this was just like a, an object being pushed like a hockey puck or something like that across the surface of ice. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but there's a surface here and you're pushing this way. So, all right. Yeah. So we've got that equation. we got the other equation. Um, we need to replace the friction force here. So P cos theta minus the coefficient of friction times the normal force is equal to MA. And our goal is to find acceleration. But if we look at this equation on the left, we don't know what the normal force is. It's not given in the problem. We don't know it, but we do know what P is. So we need to find the normal force, right? And that we can find from this equation right here. This equation tells us that the size of the normal force is equal to the weight plus P 
key sign theta. Notice that, as usual, the normal force in this class is not just equal to the weight of the object. It's equal to the weight of the object plus this downward force. Because if you push down on an object, you add normal force to it, right? You push down on it, you increase the contact force. All right, so if that's the normal force, we can take that and we can plug it into our equation over here on the left, and then we can solve for the acceleration. So doing that, we'll get P cos theta minus the coefficient of friction times all of this stuff. So we're plugging in for N. So we have Mg plus P sine theta. And all of that is equal to mass times acceleration. And I think we can solve now because we just want to find A, right? So let's do that. This is going to give us that the acceleration is equal to. Okay, let's do this in uh, the following way. We'll just divide the M to the left hand side. Like that. And then we can plug everything over here. All right, so we've got P, which is 10. Times the cosine of the angle, which is 37 degrees. Minus mu, which is 0.4. Times mg, so 2 kilograms. Every time you use g, we're always just going to say g is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. Not negative, just that's the number. That's what g means. We already made it negative because we made it point down in our picture, right? Okay, so m times g. plus P sine theta, if we just barely fit all this stuff in here, all divided by the mass of the object. Can we use 10 for gravity to make it easier? Um, we did that in the past. I don't think we're going to do that on these problems, though. We're dividing by mass, mostly because I don't want you to get confused and think you can do that on your homework. Um, okay, so M goes in here, uh, that was two kilograms. Yeah, so can you calculate what you get for the acceleration out of all of this? Let's see, cos 37 is um, three over five. So this is gonna be six minus, this is gonna be eight, this is 19.6. I don't know that I can do this one in my head. This is pretty tough. Yeah, can you guys, can you all calculate this for me, please? And tell me what you get. I'm just trying to think out what the answer should be. got an answer yet? Even if you get it wrong, I'd appreciate it if you just type someone in. No, you should get a negative answer. It's going to be negative. Okay. You guys are all agreeing. That's good. Okay, so we get an answer that's negative 1.13. Now, this should, I mean, obviously, uh, yeah, you thought it was wrong because it's negative and you doubted yourself. Yeah, you should. Absolutely. Just because you get an answer and the calculator gives you an answer doesn't mean it's right, right? So this doesn't really make any sense, right? This is this is kind of a nonsensical type of an answer. We know that we're pushing it to the right. We made the right direction positive. So what's possible? Well, we could have made a mistake somewhere. 
we could have easily made a mistake in our calculations. We can go back and check. Uh, in this equation, the n minus, this all looks right. We added it to the right-hand side. This was positive. We stuck it in here. Yeah, so it seems like it's negative. And uh, there's not much we can do about it because even if you just kind of kind of check the numbers, you're going to find out that this whole term right here is always going to be greater than this term right here, right? And what that really means, if you think back to it, if you think back to where that term came from, it's really this term right here, right? It's the friction force. Maybe it's easier to look at this piece right here. It's the friction force. And yeah, that's right, Chris. That means that it doesn't move. It doesn't actually move. And the reason why it doesn't move is because the force that's pushing it forward, P cosine theta, is basically smaller than the friction force. That means it's not, it's not enough to make it move, basically, right? So since P cos theta, the forward pushing force, is less than friction, then it doesn't actually move. And that actually means that it wasn't really um, kinetic friction, right? It was actually static friction all along um, because we're not actually pushing hard enough to make it move. So let me ask you this question then. Since this number is greater than the size of the friction force that we got, how big is the friction force actually? The acceleration in truth for part A is zero, right? That's the answer for part A. So what is the friction force actually equal to? It's not 10 newtons. Although that's kind of close. I, mean, I think you're thinking in the right way. Five point twelve? How did you get five point twelve? Oh, this is eight. It's not ten. It's not why did I think it was? Oh, cosine thirty seven, so this should have been eight. Oops. The question is since the object doesn't actually move. How big is the friction force? Yeah, it's it's eight newtons basically. Yeah. So since this is zero, that means that p cosine theta is equal to the friction force basically, right? Which means the friction force in the first part is actually equal to about eight newtons. All right. It's not always equal to this because it's actually static friction. Now, I wrote it as kinetic because the whole point of the first part of this problem is just to see that you sometimes get negative answers. And at that point, you need to use your brain to go back and figure out what's actually going on, right? And you were all smart enough to realize that it was, that it was a problem, and you kind of fixed it, right? Okay, now, let's do the, the second part of the problem. This one, it will actually move. So all the math that we've done so far is, is correct. All we need to do is we just need to change the force to 30 newtons. So what do you get if you plug in 30 newtons into your equation? You should, you're probably not going to get zero this time. So part A, the answer is it doesn't move. Uh, what do you get if you plug in all of that stuff? It's not going to be in Newtons. Oh, if you got eight point nine. Um, you just need to divide by 2, Kelvin. So 4.4? 4. 4. Yeah, that's what I got. So that's the answer to part B. So there we go. That force is large enough to overcome the friction. 
right. Any questions? Primary reason for doing this problem is just to help you to realize that sometimes you got to use your brain. Okay. Let us. I actually had a good question, Professor. Okay. So when you're saying force, when you said find uh, what's how big was the force? Uh, I kind of got confused. I was trying to find um, the friction force. That's how I got ten newtons. I mean, when you say that, how can we just like kind of distinguish which force you're talking about? Well, so when an object doesn't move, the size of the friction force is the same as the applied force. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, okay, my bad. Well, that's okay. That's a good question. I'm sure other people have the same question. Okay. All right, next we're going to do this one right here. It's kind of a short problem, but it's a good problem related to some problems you'll see on your homework. Okay, so we have a 120-pound person that stands on a scale in an elevator. So here's the scale. Here's the person. They appear to be wearing a backpack for some reason. If the scale suddenly reads 150 pounds, we want to find the acceleration of the elevator. And then we want to find the reading if the elevator starts to accelerate downwards at 4 feet per second squared. And then we want to find the scale reading if the cable supporting the elevator breaks. All right. So person in an elevator, they have, remember this is not mass, this is weight. When you have something that's in uh, in pounds, that is the weight of the person, 120 pounds. It says, if the scale suddenly reads 150 pounds, because if the elevator is going upwards, the scale is going to read a higher number, something you probably should have experienced. If you've been, if you've been in an elevator before, then you notice that when you go upwards, you feel your body pushed down into the ground, right? You kind of feel heavier when you're in an elevator that's going up. And when the elevator goes down, you feel lighter. And if you happen to be standing on a scale, you would actually see the difference in what your apparent weight, we call that your apparent weight. So if the scale reads 150 pounds, find the acceleration. I feel like problems like this are um, deceptive because they seem really simple. It seems like you should be able to do something like just take 150 minus 120 and use that to find the acceleration, right? But no matter how simple the problem seems, it is still worth your while to like draw a free body diagram and to try to solve it using that method. So, what are the forces acting on this person that's in this elevator as the accelerator as, as the elevator accelerates upwards? And keep in mind that I don't care about the force on the scale. I don't care about the force of tension in the elevator. I don't care about forces on the elevator itself. I only care about the forces on the person. What are the forces on the person? So one of them is the weight of the person, that's right. I think I can draw this one freehand. It's all in one dimension, if that's okay with you. Well, it just looks awful. I can't do it. I can't do it. All right, so this is going to go this way. All right, that's the weight of the person that acts downwards. Normal and gravity, and that's it. Which one should be bigger? If the elevator moves upwards, which should be bigger, the normal force or the weight of the person? Should I draw this one longer? Or should I make the other one longer? Which should be bigger, the normal force or the weight? Yep, the normal force, that's right. Because the person is moving upwards. So this is my normal force. The system moves up, right? So we can see that the acceleration in the picture is upwards, but I'm still gonna draw that on my picture here and just say, my acceleration in this case is up. Now, this is, again, this is really important, so don't forget what I'm about to say. You need to make the direction that the acceleration is positive. You have to do that. Well, you don't have to, but I highly recommend that you do so. So I'm going to say, I need to sneeze. I'm trying not to. That uh, this is going to be the positive y direction. So we're keeping the direction positive that is associated with... Um, the acceleration. Make the direction of the acceleration positive. All right, that's it. 
that's our picture. Next step is to use Newton's uh, second law. We're going to say net force acting in the y direction needs to be equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration in the y direction. We're just calling that acceleration A. So uh, our goal is to find what that's equal to, the acceleration. We have two forces. We have the normal force and the weight. N goes up, so we write N minus W, which is down, and say that that is equal to mass times acceleration. And yeah, we basically just need to figure out what um, uh, what A is. But we also need to know what the normal force is. What is the normal force going to be? 150 pounds, that's right. So the normal force is going to be exactly what the scale reads. That's ultimately what a scale does, is it reads the normal force. It doesn't actually read your weight. It reads how hard your body is pushing down on the scale. And you can increase that number. Like, let's say you go to the bathroom and you stand on a bathroom scale. If you put your hand on any surface in your bathroom that's near, you can reduce what your weight says, right? Like, you can push down on the counter and the scale will read a smaller weight, right? Um, you could also push up on something, and it would increase the reading on the scale. All right, so the scale reads your weight. So we know what the left-hand side of this equation is. It's going to be 150 minus 120. Now, part of this problem that might not be immediately clear to you is, what is the mass of the person? What is the mass of the person? And how do I find it? You have to do weight to find it by gravity, exactly. So the relationship is that weight is equal to mass times gravity. And if I want to find the mass of the person, I need to take that person's weight and I need to divide by gravity, where in this problem, gravity is going to be equal to what? What are we going to use for gravity? Thirty-two feet per second squared. That's gravity. All right, so I'm going to plug things in um, just just like this. So what we have is n minus w is going to be equal to m, which is going to be weight divided by gravity times the oops times the acceleration of the object. And now we just need to solve for the acceleration. So we'll write g over w times n minus w is going to be equal to the acceleration. And then we'll plug in g is going to be 32. We'll divide by the weight, which is 120. And we'll multiply that times the normal force minus the weight, which is 150 minus 120. So this is going to be what? 30 over 120, which is a quarter. I think this is what you're going to get. So that means that the... Did I do that right? Do you all get the same answer? All right. Okay, so... Everything just lit. Are you having problems with the stream? Sorry, I wish I could wish I could help with that. All right. Next, that's part A. Um, part B, we want to find the reading if the elevator starts to accelerate downwards at four feet per second squared. So I'm going to take this picture here and I'm going to show how this is going to change. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll just draw a new picture. So in part B, it's going down, right? So if I come in here and I draw my um, my weight vector, try to get it straight, and I draw my normal vector. Now I'm going to make the normal vector smaller because the system is accelerating down now. at 4 feet per second squared. 
It's a new problem, so I can use a new set of axes. So I'm going to make down positive now because I want to make the direction of the acceleration positive. And then we just do exactly what we did in the previous problem. We say net force acting in the y direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration. In the y direction, we have down positive now. So I'm going to write w minus n. And then I'm going to replace the mass with the weight divided by gravity. And in this case, we're trying to find the reading. So find the reading if the elevator starts to the reading on the scale, which means we're trying to calculate the normal force. So if we isolate the normal force, we'll get w minus w over g times a is going to be equal to n. We can factor a w out, so it'll be basically 1 minus a over g is equal to the normal force. And we'll get w was 120. You multiply that by 1 minus the acceleration due to, in this case, is 4 divided by gravity, which is 32. I'm not going to write the units because it's a ratio. So the units would just cancel anyway. So all that's going to be equal to the normal force. Almost off the screen, but not quite. This is then equal to, let's see, 4 over 32 would be 1 over 8. 1 minus 1 over 8 is 7 over 8. Oh, this isn't divisible by 8. What do you all get if you fit this in? 105. That would be the reading on the scale. Ah, it's not in Newtons though, is it? Definitely not in Newtons, it would be in pounds. Okay, there we go. That's the reading on the scale. Any questions? Part C says find the scale reading if the cable supporting the elevator breaks. If the cable breaks, what is the scale going to read? Yeah, zero. That's right, Joanne. Because if you, you could, you, you can either think about it just logically. If the cable breaks, the whole system is going to be falling downwards. Everything, the elevator, the Persia, and the scale will all be falling at the same rate. So there's really nothing to push against at that point. Everything is basically going to be effectively weightless. Because when you're in free fall, you're essentially weightless. Um, so the other way you can think about it is if everything is accelerating downwards at the ex same acceleration as gravity, then our equation here, we would just put g over g, which should be 1. 1 minus 1 is 0, you get 0. I wonder what you might think about it. But the answer is basically just 0. Pounds. All right. Pretty, I mean, it's a simple problem, right? It's a really straightforward problem if you know how to do it. I think if you're a student that just reads this problem, it's not simple at all, right? Because you need to, I mean, for me, it's simple because I know how to do this stuff. Whether it's simple for you or not, I don't know. But you have, I think you have a homework problem that's kind of similar to this. Any questions? This is the most important thing. Make the direction of the acceleration positive. Assumptions of formulas that makes it a little more challenging. Yeah, I agree. Okay, next. This one. This is another oh, simple one. We can do it very quickly, but uh, I think it's kind of deceptive. Alright, so we have a pendulum hanging in an accelerating car. It makes an angle theta with the vertical. And we want to find what is the acceleration of the car, OK? So this uh, car, if the acceleration was 0, there's basically a ball attached to a string. And that ball would really would just be hanging straight up and down. But when you accelerate, the ball moves kind of slightly backwards. 
just in the same way that if you're in your own car and there's something sitting on the floor, let's say, of your passenger seat or something like that, like a ball, if you drive forward, the ball will move backwards, right? Or if you have some groceries sitting on the floor and you drive forwards, the groceries would slide back or they might tip over backwards, right? If you move forwards, anything inside the car is going to want to go the opposite way because it has inertia and it tends to want to stay still while the car moves forward. Yeah, Chris is right. He immediately said inertia. It's because of inertia, exactly. The object wants to stay still, but the car is moving forward, and if there's not enough friction to cause the object to stay in place, it will simply roll backwards. All right. So there we go. So we're going to solve for the angle, and what we're going to find out is that the, the angle... Oh, no, we're not going to solve for the angle. We're going to solve for the acceleration. We're going to find that the acceleration is directly related to the angle, which means that this angle could be a way to measure the acceleration of such a system. Um, if you've ever heard the term accelerometer, something that measures acceleration, that's exactly what this kind of object is. All right, so we need to draw forces, all right? And our goal is to find the acceleration of the car, right? What am I going to draw the forces on? Am I going to draw the forces on the car, the forces on the ball, or both? Which should I draw a free body diagram for? The ball? Okay. Both? All right, let's see, let's see if, let's start with just the ball and see if it's enough. All right, the ball is going to have forces. What are the forces on the ball going to be? Tension. The tension is going to kind of act at an angle like this, right? So there's the tension force. And then the weight. And that is it. There are no other forces. All right, let's see if I can actually draw this to scale. Something like that. That's too long. Wow. I, I'm, I'm not good at eyeballing things, that's for sure. All right, there we go. So what I'm doing is I'm making it so that, it, to make it to scale, I'm just making it so that the, the Y component of my tension is going to be the same as the length of the weight, and that'll make, that'll make it work out. So that's my weight, and that's my tension. And I'm just going to draw one other line in here, which is going to end up being one of our axes. Like this. We'll make it black. Oh, no, I didn't do it. Make it black. So that's going to be one of our axes right there. And the angle here will be theta. So next thing to do is to define our coordinate system. Uh, we're going to need an x, y axis. So I'm going to draw another line in here this way. That's going to be my x axis. So this is going to be my positive x direction because the whole system is accelerating in that direction. And our goal, of course, is to find what this is. We next need to break up our vectors into components. So we'll take the y component of this here. We'll point up like this. That's going to be the y component of the tension. And there's going to be an x component for the tension, which will go this way. Make that one green. And we'll say theta is here. This is tension. So this side is going to be t times the sine of theta. And the other side will be t cos theta. And now we need to write down Newton's laws. OK, now let me clarify some things about this problem. As the car is moving, it says that the pendulum makes an angle theta with the vertical. So we're going to assume that that angle is constant. Okay. Now, since I made the x direction to the right, my a is going to be what I call a sub x. So the right-hand side of this equation is just going to become m times a. The left-hand side of the equation is going to be the sum of all forces acting in the x direction. There's only one force acting in the x direction, and that's t sine theta. And I guess I can make all this green to indicate this is the x direction. All right. Make this one blue. All right. What's the acceleration in the y direction going to be here? 
is going to be equal to gravity. It's going to be zero. That's right. So the idea is that the ball is going to maintain the same elevation above the ground. Call that y, for example, the height above the ground. It has the same elevation as it's moving, so it has no y acceleration. That's assuming that the surface is level. All right. Um, so the right-hand side of this equation then just becomes zero. This is going to happen a lot in a lot of the problems you do. You can almost always make it so that the acceleration is confined along one direction. You can't always do that, but most of the time you can. Okay, in the y direction, uh, I guess we'll make the positive y point up. We have t cos theta minus the weight is equal to zero. Our goal is to find a. So what we want to do now is to just solve for t. Here, um, in this problem, actually, what we'll do is for the weight, we'll just say the weight is basically just m times g, right? Let's replace the weight with mg, because it'll be related to this mass over here. All right, so then we're going to have t is equal to mg divided by cos theta. And we take this t, and we plug it in here. So t is going to be mg divide cos theta times sine theta is equal to ma. Sine over cosine is tangent. The masses are going to cancel out from each side. So we'll get g tan theta is equal to the acceleration. And that's the answer. So the acceleration is directly related to the tangent of the angle made here, which means such a device can be used to actually measure the acceleration of an object. The bigger the angle, the bigger the acceleration. And if the angle was something like 90 degrees or very close to it, then the acceleration would be really large, right? If this ball was like way up here near the top, the object would be moving really fast. And if the object is closer to the bottom here, it'd be moving really slow. And if the angle is zero, the tangent of zero is zero, so the acceleration is zero. And that's it. Any questions? The, the theta on the triangle, you can put it in a... What? Can I put it up here, you mean? Like on the other side of the hypotenuse. Over here? No, uh, the upwards, but on that line. Um, I could have... You're saying I could basically draw a line like this? Yeah, you, you could do that, correct? Yeah. Just making sure. Sure, no problem. And we should probably take a break. Uh, the next problem that we're going to do, I'll throw it up around the picture, and you can basically get started by drawing the free body diagrams if you want to, is going to be this one. This one has two two objects. The next few problems will be... Um, you know what we should do, actually? Because I think the one after this one's a little easier. So maybe we do this one first, and then we'll do this one afterwards. Let's do that. That way we kind of slowly scale up in difficulty. All right, so there we go. We're gonna do this one next. After that, we're gonna do this one. So if you wanna try during the break to draw free body diagrams for this problem number eight, and then if you finish with that one, draw free body diagrams for this one, which is gonna have two objects, you can do that. And that way you'll have kind of a, a way to get kind of set up. Ah, oh, there's no friction in this problem. I don't wanna do this one. That's silly. There's, it's really dumb when there's no friction. Because then you just, I mean, it's just totally unrealistic. I mean, there's so much about physics problems that's unrealistic, but the, the frictionless surface part is always very bothersome to me. That being said, the, um, the way we model friction is also kind of simplistic, but that is probably fine. Okay, we'll do the, these two, actually. So, um, three objects, two objects. See if during the break, if you can draw um, free body diagrams and maybe just try to set it up as much as you can. So we're gonna take a ten. Well, we'll take like a little bit longer break. Give you time to work on these. We'll take a twelve minute break, which will be in, we're starting again at four ten p.m. Um, before we go on break, does anyone have any questions? Mini bullies. This is one with mini bullies, right? One, two. Is that enough, Tom Boy? 
I have another one that has like nine pulleys too, if you want. And then uh, this is the problem that I have at the end of class that we've been looking at that has four pulleys all connected together, if, if that's what you're talking about, Tom Pui. Like this one? We will do one like this. So hopefully that'll help you with Because I know that there's at least one homework problem. Is that what you're thinking of? There's a homework problem where you have, like, it's basically something kind of like this setup right here. Yeah, the number 11 is five. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll, we'll go over that one because that can definitely be really tricky. But that'll probably be toward the end of class.